Hi there, John Cantera, the double broker bounty hunter here. And today I am dropping my usual name and we're going to add to it Brother John, the lay minister of freight. And we're doing that in this chapel here, not to be sacrilegious, though I'm sure many of my critics will say it is. Uh, we are doing that here because we are going to be reviewing the 12 deadly sins of trucking. So without further ado, I'd like to present a reading from the Book of Brokers to Carrier 411, The 12 Deadly Sins of Trucking. And the trucking gods reached out from on high and declared in a booming voice, Thou shalt not commit unethical or deceptive behavior. Now, this is a very catch-all type of sin. And freight guards that carry this particular tag are usually low grade. The only issue is, is that this isn't often the act only accusation that exists on a freight guard with carrier 411. This particular action, unethical or deceptive uh, behavior, it's a catch all. It can really mean anything. Anything that a broker didn't understand from the carrier when the carrier booked the load, or any misunderstanding between the carrier and the broker or really anything that just, well, caught the broker by surprise, can draw a freight guard with this particular accusation. I can tell you that if you want to avoid being accused of this first deadly sin, then communication is key. In fact, communication is key for all of these sins. So if you want to avoid the freight guard for unethical or deceptive behavior and business practices, communicate. That really is the bottom line. Wait a minute. I, 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 I hear the angels from on high are about to hit us with our second deadly sin. Thou shalt not have unresolved claims issues. You don't typically see this freight guard getting thrown around. But what you have are carriers who get slammed with claims, whether or not they are actually responsible for those claims. So if you're going around and you're just doing your thing, you're cruising on the road, you're jamming out to your music, you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you plow into a car in front of you, you know, you, hit, you slam the brakes, cargo goes flying everywhere in the back of your truck, it is a mess, okay? You got cargo damage. Well, it's the carrier's fault. Uh, and all the cargo was either not properly secured or whatever. But all the damage that results from that is usually going to have a claim. And when you have those claims, those claims need to be addressed. So normally what a broker is going to do is if there's a claim, they're going to alert you, the carrier, that there's a claim. Once that claim has been alerted, they're going to contact your insurance company and file on your insurance. This is normal procedure, nothing to get upset about. Your insurance company is then going to contact you. It's going to contact the driver and make sure that they know all the particulars of what went on. So in a lot of cases, if you are guilty of causing the issue and having liability, the insurance company is going to say, yeah, you know what? <laughs> You're liable and we'll pay out the claim. Now, if you did something really bad, and they won't pay the claim out, but you're still liable, well, <laughs> you still got to deal with it in one way or another. And there are ways to deal with it. But again, communicating with the broker is going to be the best way to handle it. The problem comes in when the insurance company deems the carrier not liable. If it is nothing you did wrong, 
and you are not liable for the claim, you can still get hit with a freight guard as a revenge tactic. And this is for the broker to force the carrier to engage on the claim and try to assume responsibility. Usually it is a scare tactic. Usually it is something that isn't warranted, but sometimes it is. We have helped carriers deal with claims issues when it comes to this particular type of freight guard, but it's important that you try to come up with a resolution first. If you are staunch in your position that you're not liable, the broker is going to be staunch in their position that you have some liability and they're going to throw this freight guard on you. Now, how damaging will this freight guard be to a carrier? Not terribly. Now, there are, of course, brokers out there that say if you have any freight guards whatsoever, boom, you're done. We don't touch you no matter what. Frankly, brokers, if you work for an organization that feels that way, you're part of the problem. You're part of the divide that exists between brokers and carriers. We should be working together, not apart. So that particular mentality, yeah, use better judgment for a change. A lot of these carriers don't deserve some of these sins. So please pay attention to what's going on. If you have an unresolved claim issue, you can potentially be stuck with this kind of freight guard. I do hear the gods speaking again, and the cargo gods are reaching out from on high for the third deadly sin. Thou shalt not cancel after accepting a load. Canceling after accepting a load is a uh, is a big deal you don't want to cancel pretty much ever when you accept a load now a lot of quite a lot of the questions that i get when people are stuck with uh freight guards of this type are at what point am i committed to the load legally that point is when you sign the rate confirmation that's when you now have a written agreement. But as soon as you or your dispatcher sits there and says the words, I'll take it, you now have put yourself into a verbal agreement. And based on those words, a broker is now going to take down their post, is going to make all the necessary preparations for the particular carrier to haul the load. Now, if the carrier decides later, I don't want this load, that can be a problem because you, one, just wasted the broker's time, and two, you may have put the broker in an impossible situation. And it's typically when that impossible situation occurs that this freight guard comes about. It's one thing entirely if as a dispatcher you book the load you called your carrier and told him hey this is what's going on and carrier's like dude i can't do that i just got to check engine light on my truck i just can't make that happen i got to get this thing checked out and then you as the dispatcher immediately call the broker and say hey dude i just called my driver this is what they told me i'm sorry i can't take the load you should not get a freight guard on this when you have such a quick cancellation immediately after you say i do okay i mean look of it like a marriage as soon as you say i do you're married and if you realize you know very shortly thereafter that uh hey you know what it was this is a bad idea you know then you get an annulment you know it's as if it never happened Okay, well, this particular freight guard makes the same type of assumptions. If you make the cancellation immediately after you do the booking, then there's usually no harm, no foul, because the broker can turn around, repost it fairly quickly, and can then try to get somebody else covered on the load. It's all about time and how much time you give the broker when it comes to canceling the load so they can go ahead and recover. If you spend 
two, three hours sitting on the load before you tell the broker you can't do it, that's a problem. The sooner you say something, the better off you're going to be. Remember, protecting yourself from these sins is about communication. And the gods are communicating with me now. It is time for the fourth deadly sin. Thou shalt not commit no show and no call. This piggybacks off of the third sin. Because being no call, no show, or no show, no call, you know, got to get the order right. Being in that position implies that you've completely lost contact with your driver. You're an ineffective communicator. Oh, and by the way, you don't give the broker a chance to try to salvage the load. And it is dramatically going to harm their relationship, meaning the broker's relationship, with their shipper. That's a bad deal. I find this particular freight guard getting thrown out far more often than canceling after accepting a load uh, when a broker is impacted financially or by reputation or whatever means of uh, impact the broker is dealing with when it comes to their shipper. You know, as soon as you tell them that the truck belongs to them, they're going to tell their shipper. Hey, we got this truck coming. If the truck doesn't show up, broker looks like a liar to their customer. That's not good. And that's why this particular freight guard exists. Can it be defended against? Yes, it can. It is exceptionally hard, though. And I can tell you from experience, this particular freight guard, if you ended up costing the broker, their customer, as a result of this action, this one will never go away. Gods are speaking to me now. It is time for sin number five. Thou shall not commit persistent canceling. Let's go back to number three, uh, canceling after accepting a load said before in most cases that's not a terrible sin you're not going to get a freight guard for it as long as you communicate often you communicate regularly and you know especially if you can cancel immediately after you book that's usually not a problem now if you do that on a regular basis now you've got a problem because it's about establishing a pattern of behavior now, I know a lot of carriers out there who think that brokers are nitpicking us to death. I, I feel you. I hear you. You got to look at it from both sides here. And the reason why I say that is because brokers have the power to throw these freight guards on us. So we don't have the power to do anything back. So we kind of need to figure out how to deal with this instead of having to deal with the freight guard once the freight guards against you. So. When you are in a situation that you are regularly having to call the broker straight back and cancel, you're putting a bad taste in that guy's mouth. And it's now a matter of trust. Doesn't matter what the real issue is. What's going through the mind of the broker is that you are probably still looking for more loads and you just found a load better than theirs. And so you're calling to cancel. And that's bad juju. It's bad juju because it's a violation of a contract. So you really have to be careful if you have a habit of canceling loads. If you are stuck canceling loads, especially for any kind of reason that you can think of, have proof. Your carrier may have a check engine light come on in the truck, have them take a picture with a timestamp of the dashboard with the check engine light on it to prove your case. You send that to the broker and say, look, this just happened. Okay, please don't hold it against us. I'm sorry. If you need to, please recover. That will fix all of these issues right up front because every broker knows that shit happens because it does. This is a trucking industry. Shit happens every day. It's when they think that a carrier is lying to them that they get the itch. 
defile that freight yard and accuse you of yet another deadly sin. And so let us continue reading from the good book and take a look at sin number six. Thou shalt not have repeated pickup or delivery service failures. Repeated failures, service failures specifically, are a problem. It is an indicator of bad performance of a carrier as a general standard. And we don't want that. We want brokers to think that we're good carriers. We want brokers to think that when we make a promise, we're going to deliver. Uh, we want brokers to think that we are people of our word. And, and dispatchers play a part in this because dispatchers are usually the face of most carriers out there. So Carriers need to make sure their dispatchers are doing everything they need to to make sure that there are not any service failures. For a dispatcher to forget to tell a carrier, oh, this is your appointment time, or oh, this is when you need to deliver, or oh, they just changed the delivery address, or oh, they have these particular requirements. Anytime you don't meet requirements or anytime you're, you miss the pickup or delivery window, you're in violation. This particular freight guard is when you do it on a regular basis. Now, yes, I have seen brokers use this freight guard in a one-time occurrence. I have seen it. I've seen them do everything possible to defend it. I have successfully defended carriers from this particular accusation, but... Any kind of accusation that shows up on carrier 411 has to only be removed by the broker that issued it. And if you can't convince that broker that it needs to go away, it's not going away. So you got to do everything you can to protect yourself. And communication is that key. And your broker, your uh, uh, dispatcher should be the one doing effective communication for you at all times if you don't dispatch yourself. We're going to start getting into the more serious of the sins. Now, yes, all of these are deadly sins only because freight guards have the ability to completely destroy a carrier company in one false swoop. But these are when things start getting really hairy. So let us go ahead and listen to the words of sin number seven. Thou shall not have in transit agreement modifications in transit agreement modifications are basically any kind of situation where we are going off script from the rate confirmation this would be if you needed a uh, new uh, delivery appointment uh, if you have um detention or layover and you're insistent upon getting uh that updated into the rate confirmation pretty much anything that changes the rate confirmation or the conditions and terms of the agreement the broker's agreement with the carrier can draw a freight guard such as this um i worked a case recently where this particular accusation was used because a carrier filed on a broker's bond less than 30 days after the load was completed and according to the broker's contract with the carrier you know the carrier is required to give the broker a full 30 days before they start filing reports for non-payment well the broker or sorry the carrier filed a report to the or to the uh, to the surety bond uh, at around 15 days after delivery. There's a lot of circumstances behind it, but a failure of the carrier to understand the terms and conditions of the contract and then acting in contravention to the contract is what drew that particular freight guard. And I'm sorry to say that particular freight guard is not going away anytime soon. These can be very touchy. 
uh, now a broker is going to interpret an in transit agreement modification to be anything that is outside the scope of their contract or the rate confirmation. So anytime that you have an issue where there's going to be a change, uh, such as detention, layover, anything like that, make sure a new rate confirmation is issued. Does that mean your old rate confirmation is no longer valid? No, it does not. So don't think that you can say, you know what? I'm shutting down until I get that new rate confirmation. Uh, 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 uh. Sorry, the old rate confirmation is still in force until a new one supersedes it, regardless of any verbal exchange. So if there's a change that's been made, make sure it comes in writing in a form of a rate confirmation. Let us go ahead and move on to sin number eight. Thou shalt not commit theft or unjustified cargo loss. I know of a lot of people who look at the cargo they have and sit there and say, man, I could really go for that. You know, uh, I recently had a carrier who was hauling a bunch of Gatorade, you know, palletized Gatorade. Man, I really go for a Gatorade. Don't you dare touch that cargo. <laughs> you know, it, it it seems like it goes without saying. But committing theft or losing cargo improperly is a, well, it's a problem. It will definitely lead to a claim. And it will cause other issues too. Now, if you are dealing with a theft situation, you need to make sure that you call the local police and report the theft. You need to make sure that it is immediately reported to the broker. And we need to take a look and see, well, was there a seal provided? Was the truck sealed? Was it locked? Um, was, were the seals and locks cut? Things of that nature. Now, you're probably not going to have to deal with this as a trucker, you know, unless you stop overnight. You know, you hit the truck stop, you get some sleep, you wake up the next morning, and if you don't do your walk around before you pull out, you may not notice that that lock got cut the night before and some of your cargo was taken off. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So security is important. If you're not dealing proper security, one, you will be liable for any kind of claim. And two, you can get this particular freight guard. So let us go ahead and move on to sin number nine. Thou shall not commit fraudulent activity fraudulent activity like unethical or deceptive business practices is another catch-all and a lot of times both of them will appear side by side on a freight guard and a fraudulent activity is when the broker has an impression that the carrier is doing something insidious if there is an active deception going on at least in the broker's mind then they can throw this freight guard on you. And it is very difficult to defend because anything can be considered fraudulent. Uh, anything from uh, 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 a bad piece of paper in your setup package or some misleading information, maybe you put a bad phone number in your setup package. You know, and then uh, the, the broker's trying to call the driver, can't get through. And if the broker can't get through and the tracking's not working, they think, oh, hell, they may have stolen the cargo. They may have double brokered the cargo. They may have done all sorts of kind of stuff. So now, now you're sitting in that fraudulent activity spectrum. And once you're in that spectrum, you're a suspect. And you almost have to prove yourself innocent before the broker's going to think otherwise. So, again, this is one of those situations where communication is going to go a long way into making sure that things are going to be better presented for yourselves in the future. So stay away from fraudulent 
activity. Now we are going into the final and the biggest three sins that occur in this industry. So sin number two. Thou shalt not back solicit a shipper. I am all for folks who, who want to expand their business and try to get direct shippers for customers. Carriers, there is no better way to do business than to have a direct shipper. There is also no better way to strengthen your shoulders than to have uh, your supervisor climb up onto them. So as we're dealing with uh, these issues, apparently he likes listening to the gospel of trucking uh, life. And he, uh, uh, he gets very enamored uh, by that. Anywho, back soliciting a shipper is a huge problem. And I know of a lot of truckers uh, when they go to a shipper, especially new truckers, they go to a shipper, they got business cards, they're proud of their business, they want to build their business, and they think, well, there's no harm, I'm just going to drop off a business card. Thank you very much, have a nice day, shake someone's hand, load the truck, and be gone. There's a very big problem with that. Now, granted, there is no law that says you cannot uh, contact a shipper and try to solicit work directly from them. But your contract with the broker very much has a non-solicitation clause. And that non-solicitation clause specifically says that you cannot go to a shipper to which that broker introduced you and solicit direct work from them. You can't do it, okay? Normally, there's a time limit on that. A time limit of roughly two years. Oh. And as soon as Jack heard that there was a two-year time period that he had to sit on my shoulder, he, of course, ran. In the meantime, once the two-year period has expired, then, okay, you can go ahead and start talking to, the, to that particular shipper. But remember, until then, that shipper is the broker's customer and anytime you serve to disrupt that relationship it is a massive massive foul and will put you in very hot water there are three freight guards that come up that when verified will guarantee destroy your company this is one of them okay if you're out there trying to build your business and get shippers for yourself, the one thing you cannot do is go to a shipper to where you've already been, thanks to a broker. Go to any other shipper you want, but not to a shipper to which you were introduced through a broker, because you will find yourself in this situation. You know, the, we have one particular issue that recently took place where a carrier thought that the broker lost the contract with this particular shipper. Turns out that wasn't the case. Turns out that the broker, frankly, did not want to continue to use that carrier anymore. So the carrier told, or the broker told a little white lie to the carrier to indicate that they didn't have any more business from that particular shipper at that time. So the ship or the carrier took it upon themselves to go and visit the shipper because the shipper happened to be local to his office. Bad, bad, bad business because the, <laughs> the uh, shipper then took a picture of the guy's business card, sent it to the broker, and the broker's like, son of a bitch. You know, especially if it's a more lucrative shipper, like pharmaceuticals, very specialized. Uh, and if you have all the specialized skills to be able to do that business well, you go behind a broker's back, they, they consider it a betrayal. They, they, they consider it almost treasonous. And they will throw the hammer of Thor against you and slam you with this particular freight guard. Guys, do not tempt fate. 
if you think about it, you either call the broker and let them know you're thinking about it, or two, better yet, just don't do it. Just don't freaking do it. We are hearing the words of the cargo gods yet again. Thou shalt not hold a cargo hostage. I see this happen too often. When a carrier is dealing with a double broker cargo, they got suckered into a scam where the, uh, the scammer offered to pay a very high rate. And then once they figure out the, the scam and the carrier calls the real broker and the real broker tells them, no, it's not that high. It's something else. If the real carrier is not getting what they were originally promised by the scammer, they may take that cargo and park and they may try to justify that under the Uniform Commercial Code, Chapter 7, Section 307, Lean of Carrier. Okay, that's cute. That's an interesting interpretation. But interpretation of that law is wrong. Okay, you cannot hold the cargo just because you don't agree with the rate. You may have an option to take the cargo back to the shipper and let the real broker worry about it, but you're not going to get a dime in the process. Or you can go ahead and accept what it is the broker was willing to pay the scammer originally and just go ahead and finish off the run. It is much more acceptable and more beneficial for a carrier to just take what is given and complete the run because that demonstrates to a broker reliability and duty, which are two things that are very important to brokers. You know, I like to give carriers this particular example because they'll sit there and say, you know, I, I negotiated $5,000 for this coast to coast run. I'm not just going to sit there and accept $3,500 and lose $1,500 because that's what the brokers, the real broker says the real rate is. Sorry, guys, that is the way of things. The law is on the broker side here, okay? Otherwise, you're holding the cargo hostage, you're actually stealing the cargo, and you can be prosecuted for it. Don't just stop and hold the cargo. You can't do that. Just accept what's happening because everything, if everything's already in motion. Be done with it, and then we all move on with the lesson learned. But if you stop and you sit there and you tell that broker, look, I was promised $5,000 for this load, and I'm not accepting $3,500. So you're going to pay me the full $5,000. Well, the broker may go ahead and pay you that full $5,000, but it's only because you extorted them. And they will slap this freight guard against you. And when they slap that freight guard against you, you will not get any more work. Guaranteed. Your company is dead. I would rather take the perceived $1,500 loss because it's only perceived. In actuality, you're really not losing anything. Fifteen, uh, The, the 3500 will cover your fuel, will cover your basic expenses. Now, you may not make a profit off of it, but it will cover everything. And it will improve your reputation overall. So overall, it's a win for everybody. But you stop and you hold that cargo after they offer you an, a new rate confirmation, They hang you. Okay, that's going to be a huge, huge, huge problem. Anytime you hold a cargo hostage for any reason, you have to be justified. By law, there is only one known and acceptable justification, and that's if there is no reasonable assurance that the carrier will be paid. The broker must specifically say, I'm not paying you. Then you can hold the cargo. There must You must not have a valid rate confirmation. Then you can hold the cargo. But in the situation we were describing earlier on like a double brokered load and the real rate is lower than the rate that was promised the carrier, you're going to have a rate confirmation. You will get paid. You may not get paid what you want to be paid, but you will get paid, which is why you cannot hold the cargo hostage. 
especially if you try to invoke it under UCC 3-307. Because if you try to turn around and sell it, then you've done everything illegally. And then that puts you in a whole world of hurt. If you are ever going to hold a cargo for any reason, first and foremost, consult an attorney and make sure you are doing it properly. If you are doing it by way of a carrier's lien, there are very specific steps that must be taken, very specific notifications that must go out. And if any of these steps are missed, then the carrier is held liable for all damage, missing freight, and potentially theft. It must be done flawlessly. So get an attorney if you're going to play that card. Otherwise, you're getting that freight card. And I'm feeling the thunder of the gods above as they stretch forth and give us the final and greatest of the deadly sins. Thou shalt not commit unauthorized rebrokering of shipment. No double brokering. Gee whiz. Here in the day and age when we are seeing double brokering being a massive, massive problem, this freight card gets thrown around a lot. This freight card can be defended, but you have to prove that you are not a double broker. So if you have owner operators that lease on to your carrier authority, you better have done it right. They better be on your insurance they better have your signage on the side of their trucks specifically uh your mc number and your company name as operated by they must specifically have the driver and the vin number of the truck appear on your coi there's a whole bunch of specifics out there and if you do not have all of these steps in place, you can get accused of this. And it can be a huge problem. Can it be defended against? Yes. Okay. It becomes a question of malicious intent. If the owner-operator has their own authority, and when the broker calls and says, hey, what's your MC number? And that owner operator gives his own personal MC number and not your carrier company's MC number, that freight card's coming. And it is a bear to defend against. Some brokers will ignore every last bit of information you try to provide as evidence in terms of defense because they just don't believe you. They think if you are brash enough to double broker their load, then you're brash enough to falsify the records. We've been through this. I've been through this exact situation numerous times. Most times I can succeed at getting the broker to understand what's going on around them and that there's a, that there's a problem they're not seeing. You know, if the, car if the carrier has been impersonated by a fraudulent entity, and it starts double brokering loads in the carrier's name. Does that carrier deserve to have a freight guard put against them? No, of course not. They're a victim. They're not the ones committing the crimes. But initially, a broker may not see that. And oh, by the way, if the carrier calls and tries to explain it to the broker, the broker is just going to dig in deeper and double down on, on his accusations. This is why... It's a good idea to hire uh, somebody else to come in as uh, an advocate for the carrier. Um, you can hire attorneys. Uh, attorneys can be brash. Attorneys can send very threatening letters that at the end of the day, the broker is not going to care about. Having an advocate, a non-attorney advocate who can call a broker from a position uh, without any kind of emotion can usually at least get a broker talking. And once you get a broker talking, 
then he may start listening. And if he starts listening, then you can present the necessary evidence to help exonerate the carrier of this or many of the other sins that we've covered today. So our recommendation to carriers who wind up with a freight guard that contain any of the 12 deadly sins is to hire an advocate who understands your situation to defend you without emotion and only with proof because it is that unemotional proof that a broker is going to need to be able to take this down. Because let's face it, if the carrier calls and expresses any level of frustration, even to the point of cussing at a broker or giving an exasperated sigh at a broker can be considered offensive. And if they do something that's offensive to the broker, the broker's just gonna hang up and stop taking your calls. A third party, an impartial third party coming in to speak on your behalf is by far your best weapon in trying to deal with these situations. Over here at the Double Broker Bounty Hunters, we do offer the service of freight guard removal. Uh, if you come to us with your situation, it is a $50 investigation fee. If we fail and we only charge it after we're done. Um, otherwise, if we succeed in getting rid of the freight guard, we drop the $50 investigation fee and we charge $500 flat for each freight guard that gets removed. We are not in the business of cleaning up the records of scammers. So if you call us to have us look into a freight guard for you, the very first thing we're doing is we're looking into you, the carrier to try to determine, are you a scammer just trying to clean your record so you can keep scamming again? Because if you are, we're not going to take your case. You know, we've got an image of our own that we want to uphold. And I'm not going to save yours just because you want to sit there and keep pulling the wool over other people's eyes. You're an honest carrier trying to do an honest day's work and you get caught up in shenanigans and get busted with a freight guard that you think is wrongfully applied or has been on your record for far too long and is still anchoring you down, I'll work with you. Give us a shout and we will be happy to try to do everything we can uh, to help you. You can hit me up at jcantera at vigilanttransport.com. Remember to check out and subscribe here to our YouTube channel uh, you can also check out our webpage at vigilanttransport.com, uh, where we have links to our videos as well as, uh, dates for upcoming webinars dealing with fraud prevention in the industry and other information that may be important, uh, for carriers and brokers out there. Uh, we also have our live show Mondays, 5 PM central time on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, etc., cetera. Uh, and with a upload of the audio going out to Spotify on Tuesdays. So please check us out. We're happy to help you guys in any way we can. And whatever you do, remember, don't let scammers take you for a ride.